that mother has me writing somehow 500 words for him for his book leading up to the Super Bowl. He's asked Will Bond for it. He's asked me for it. He's wandering around. This is around. what he's Wait, doing. Stu's he's writing he, a book? No, he's not. He's outsourcing it to all these people. He's not writing a book. It's his personal record book that he will not have written a word of, but he's going to use every grift and every... I Mina, mean, let's talk about this for a second. Yeah, let's talk about uh, it. Let's, let's, and let's reveal this to the audience. Well, it's not... We're not, we're not running. Yeah, we're okay, running. No, yeah, okay. We're running. We're going now, and I like when the off-air stuff ends up on air. Please tell me, because Stugas has just left with Billy to do something, and he's always running some sort of grift. He's asked me to ask Will Bond to write the foreword of his book. He's asked me to write the foreword of his book. And now I'm finding out, and I think Mike Schur put this whole deal together, and I don't think he's going to do any actual work. What has he asked you to do, Mina? And he's insisted that you write it on this, the busiest time of your life? Yes. Okay. So I, yes, Stu texted me, Hey, I've got this book, just asking some friends to pitch in a little bit. I actually thought, you know, I, maybe a blurb. Something I get asked to do every now and then. Maybe a, a forward is a reasonable request of an old friend like you. No, I, I get an email from Stanzik, who's helping him, uh, the ESPN producer. Uh, he wanted me, and I imagine others, to write a rebuttal to one of his chapters. The chapter is not that long. I And then he said the rebuttal could be, he's like, it could be 500, could be 1,000 words. That would make the rebuttal as long as the chapter. So essentially... He is asking people, I believe, to co-author his book without, of course, any. I don't know, think uh, he's going to write. I don't think he's going to write any of it. I no, think he did. I he, they sent me the chapter. It's not long. It is not long. And I don't think he it, wrote it. Is what I'm chat, saying. Chat GPT. Oh. I th I think yeah. either Chat GPT or a ghostwriter. I don't believe Stugatz has lifted a finger to a word processor to write anything to a, a computer. Word. Is this? Anything. You know how MLM multi-level marketing schemes work, where uh -huh. you have to build your downline and recruit. Uh -huh. I feel like I'm in Stu's downline. You like gotta he is somehow. <laughs> and oh, I left out the part, the, the the greatest part. Oh, and by the way, if you can, can you just get this to us by February 9th? Not the, the like deadline. Yes, yeah, it's a February 9th. Not any deadline. Not, Not any deadline. <laughs> Mina, literally are you busy that week? <laughs> are you busy that week? <laughs> what would you be doing that week, Mina? Why would you be busy? This freaking guy, man. Sounds and like you need I'm to get a jump it. on this. <laughs> it sounds like you, yeah. So get you, to be, work. you better you get to work. Leave? You got a, you got a week, and I, uh... I started it last night because <laughs> that's who I am. That's Mina, breaking news: Dave chunk. Canales is the head coach yes. of the Carolina Panthers. Dave Tepper finally got someone to say yes to this job. He's Ever. interviewed a lot of people. Uh, number one, handsome man. That's my main observation. I discovered him on a Monday Night Football. Didn't know he looked like that. Handsome yeah. guy. I'd follow him anywhere. That's yeah, your, I think. Yeah, that, I don't um, have a number two. That's it. That's no, it. No, no, no. I mean, immediately I mean, did, did a good job with Baker. So um, to the top of the handsome rankings, right? I mean, who's who's giving him a run there? D'Amico, Kevin, like oh, this a bit is... of a long neck. Yeah. I mean, what are we gonna do? We're just gonna oh, wow. objectify this. Person? I mean, there's, there's some definite Mitchell Trubisky vibes happening. Do, here. I think the main what? question while breaking this down is: Do you see Dave Canales speaking yeah. at Dave Tepper's funeral? <laughs> uh this is it, it feels a little bit out of left field dave canales was a first year offensive coordinator he coached quarterbacks in seattle before that it's a very rapid ascent but i always suspected the carolina job might be an out of left field hire because uh it was so undesirable candidly right like because we're talking about probably right now Arizona gives him a run for money, but one of the worst owners in the NFL in terms of like working for him. We've for a litany of reasons when it comes to Tepper. Uh, we does you know we know he does have a lot of money, so I have to think Canales got a pretty sizable contract for this. But this is quite the come up, and I think you know I mean, it's not easy or not hard. Pardon me to see why they went with him. Uh, the most important thing in Carolina is rec fixing the quarterback situation, helping Bryce Young develop, fixing the offense, and. He did a great job in Tampa this year with Baker. I was I was really impressed by the play calling, the way he tailored it around Baker's skill set, the way Baker evolved as a quarterback with Canales, getting the ball out quickly, most notoriously taking fewer sacks. So both of those are things that Bryce Young desperately needs to do in Carolina. Um, they obviously need to add a lot of talent on that side of the ball. But to that end, I do like the hire. I'd like to make a formal apology to Mitchell Trubisky. I misspoke. I meant Mike Glennon. 
Mike long, oh, the neck. Long necked yeah. Mike Glennon. Oh, you really ruined that. I ruined it. Go that. sit, go sit in the yeah. penalty box for two minutes. Wow. You've got to get Mike Glennon. Mike Glennon's wife uh, is a famous character on this show, talking to his neck. You gotta get that one right. Wait, Me- I'm can so- I tell you a story quickly about Mike Glennon? Yes. Uh I for, I think it was very early in my relationship with Orlovsky. I might be misheard. I think this is what happened. I was making fun of Mike Lennon's neck, making a lot of jokes. I mean, it is. Look it up, folks. It is. Yeah. Uh, it is a dramatically. It is uh, pretty noticeable. And Orlovsky looks at me and he goes, "I was in Mike Lennon's wedding." <laughs> so funny. You know, that's like that's that. when you start it with like, "Do you know Mike Lennon?" And then they yeah. say yes, and you're like, "Cool." Uh, and yeah. that's your story. So you have to do that actually with Dan Orlovsky anytime you're about to make fun of anyone in the NFL because as a journeyman backup quarterback he's been in a lot of weddings and is this, a lot of but is this the last spot that we're allowed to shame somebody's body uh, my fatness neck and his neck like is the the neck is now a safe space to mock some the Who, way Glennon's someone looks neck or Canales because Canales is making the neck work yeah. he is I think gl- gl- part of the reason Glennon's neck is so. Um, interesting is it raises the question of whether it helps you play quarterback kind of like you know with with all with all the trench warfare in front of you is it like a periscope where you can kind of see over you know and he's he's very tall too i think he's six six or six seven yeah, so heads above the crowd you might say that is, is I, that a saying, that is a saying right? that, it might be a compliment is what i'm saying I, no well not only that this is what i would ask you you know how serious these draft rooms are about measuring quarterbacks are you telling me that you believe in a draft room somewhere the people yes. trying to decide whether mike glennon was a first round pick made the separator look at his neck he's got a longer neck than someone else i believe like a periscope he can see over his offensive line i would bet nino's 529 that at the combine or whatever at some point in the draft process a coach said (laughs) look at the neck on that guy vision vision i I think though that something important about mike lennon is his neck isn't necessarily longer than some other people's necks his head is just narrow so it makes the neck look more of a part no Um, it's longer no it's charlie it's long okay that's wait a minute this isn't real this what's on the screen? That's not real. Why is he smoking he a cigarette? I feel the bad. cigarette that is photoshopped. Mike Lennon is handsome. Thing. Someone has to say. Yeah, I, I do have questions about coaching. Uh, we'll get to the Jim Harbaugh in a second, but uh, yeah. not that Bill Belichick was ever in play for Carolina. Bill Belichick has only been really linked to one team, and they continue to right. to interview candidates. Are we really looking at a scenario where Bill Belichick's going to be? I think fifteen wins away from Don Shula's. Uh, wins record and he's not going to have a job this year yeah we're down to the Seahawks commanders and Falcons now the game of musical chairs is is rapidly shrinking um I think it's a real possibility like at first it, it's it felt like Falcons was preordained it was a done deal but I think as some of these coaches go off the board you're seeing other coaches like Ben Johnson like Mike McDonald like Mike Vrabel who are very desirable candidates still available and suddenly old bill has some pretty serious competition for that job i think what is possible mike if if bill doesn't go to the falcons is he just takes one year off comes back i don't think he's done coaching but i could see him taking a year off and then uh coming back for whatever openings are oh but mina this is a bit of a stunner okay can we just stop for a second here are you suggesting that bill belichick is going to take a forced year off because not even Atlanta wants him after two interviews and the options are drying up. Like, what what world am but, I living in? But a lot, of, a lot of this has to be Bill Belichick being judicious, too. I, I can't imagine yeah. a world where well, Dave Tepper would prefer to have uh, Canales over Bill Belichick. Maybe that is Dave Tepper's world. But he's also well, not Jerry, shown interest. Jerry Jones's world, evidently, is it not? Like, I got to believe he kicked well, the tires on it, man. I mean, if Bill Belichick doesn't get a job... Or sits a year out and like the entire year you are going to see photo every time the cowboys lose you are going to see a giant photoshop of bill belichick wearing cowboys gear they might even just you know like that'll be a first take topic like is it time to bring in bill belichick midway through the season um one thought on bill though uh and, and as far as like why is he not like the top candidate for all these jobs you're talking about the greatest coach in nfl history a lot comes with bill a couple things uh he might not 
explicitly want the GM title, but if you bring him in, you are bringing him to run the organization, which by the way, it looks like might be the deal that Harbaugh got in LA. We'll see what they do uh, because they fired their GM as well. But some teams don't want that. Some teams already have GMs. A team like the Commanders clearly wanted to bring in Adam Peters from the 49ers. So that actually limits the openings, I think, because different some teams are just not interested in that sort of package deal. And then speaking of package deals, there's also a good chance he's going to bring some of his boys with him. Matt Patricia, Bill O'Brien, maybe. I don't know, Josh McDaniels. So again, there might be teams that aren't interested in the coaches that Bill would want to hire. Um, and if that's the case, then yeah, there might not be a the perfect choice for him. Mina, we have not talked about this enough today, and I want to get as many unspooled thoughts from you as I can because we've neglected it today and we shouldn't have. Jim Harbaugh ruling all of sport in a way that gets him that job with that power out of a cheating scandal as an undefeated champion. Holy what an amazing story that he wins in every way and that he and his brother are just conquerors of that sport on the pro level and on the collegiate level. Yeah, I mean, he is kind of the case study for winning solves everything, right? Because if he hadn't won with Michigan, such a different narrative today. The way we think about him leaving, I would say, like, we're barely talking about, you know, the potential punishments and all of that. It's like, whatever he won, it's fine. They got their, you know, it's it's over, it's whatever. And he's a big winner. If he hadn't won, I think that would be a pretty, um, that w- and he still took the Chargers job. I think that would dominate the conversation today around it, Jim Harbaugh fleeing college football, just as the hammer is about to come down or whatever. I personally don't care. I'm just saying um, that, you know, his record as a winner, the fact that he's turned around so many organizations, that is now the story of his career. And I personally think he'll probably have a lot of success. We'll see something similar in Los Angeles. Uh, Mina, but this is why I think the Cosmos are laughing at me and how cutthroat that sport is. Belichick can't get a job and Harbaugh just got a great one with all of the power after cheating uh that's unbelievable like I understand I watched it happen so I understand but I, I, you can understand how a lifelong but, journalist would be confused by Belichick can't has to has to grovel before the Falcons with two interviews and they don't necessarily want but, him but Harbaugh gets all the power Bill Belichick is coming off of two yeah. disastrous seasons one of which was largely his doing in making those horrible offensive coordinator hires. So that is fresh in everyone's mind. Jim Harbaugh is coming off of turning a program around, winning a national championship. It's a what have you done for me lately league. So I actually don't find this that surprising, frankly. The other thing I'll say about Harbaugh is he has been very good at identifying coaching talent underneath him. I mean, the guy in Baltimore, Mike McDonald, uh, in Michigan, Jesse Minter. So if I'm an owner... I'm looking at him, and I'm like, this guy is very good at hiring. Bill Belichick, not so much. Well, not only that, you just gave the real reason. When you said that list of names that comes with Belichick, all of us recoiled at all of those names. Suicide Squad. Oh, my God. You're bringing in the Suicide Squad. Oh, my God. We all recoiled at how uh, his coaching tree is. Jim Harbaugh, as Mina outlined, has had success everywhere he's gone. He made Stanford relevant prior to that. Uh, when he was at, in college with San Diego, he turned them around. He gets to the Niners, turns them around. Then he got to Michigan, and while he did turn them around, it wasn't without its bumps in the road. In fact, if, if Rutgers doesn't miss a field goal kick, he might uh, get fired. If they actually play against Ohio State in that COVID-shortened year, he might get fired. But he pulled out a win with his experience over at Michigan. Now he's back in the NFL. But one thing changed with Jim Harbaugh that I want to talk to you about he was a great head coach for the the Niners. His his team loved him. When he went to Michigan, he really leaned into these weird eccentricities, and he's considered more of a goofball. And I don't know if that'll if that Jim Harbaugh plays whoa, in the whoa, NFL. Whoa, he was a stone cold weirdo in the NFL too. <laughs> <laughs> like that's not there's no revisionist history is happening on my watch. That dude is a truly authentically strange human being and always has been. There are so many examples uh, from his time with the San Francisco 49ers of oddball behavior. My favorite was when he tucked in every piece of clothing into his khakis for one cold weather game. That is one of my favorite. It's an indelible image to me. Um, He had weird beefs. You remember what's your deal with uh, P. 
He, by the way, that, that my favorite thing of all is that he ended up in the AFC West because he's going against the ultimate weird beef coach, Sean Payton. The post-game interactions are going to be absolutely legendary between those two. Um, he is probably the strangest coach we've got. And I am so glad he's back in the NFL because of it, because I don't want these like anodyne pretty boy McVay. They're just normal and only live and breathe football and never say anything interesting coaches. I want a guy who, you know, makes weird allusions to Catholicism and like texts, like history stuff that doesn't make any sense. I want a guy who looks like he's about to have an aneurysm every time uh, the ref makes a mistake. I want a guy who tucks all of his clothing in at once. I am so glad Jim Harbaugh is back in the NFL. Put it on the poll, please, Juju, at Levitard Show. Is uh, Jim Harbaugh a, the truly, authentically, genuinely strangest person in the universe? Uh, because, Mina, you're excited about this. The part I'm excited about, all these whiz kids losing to Harbaugh and Dan Campbell is funny. All the all the whiz kids who are who are who are bringing the new football to people and have Harbaugh wow. and Dan Campbell like club them over the head because they're just uh, strange and tough and they'll punch you in the face. Well, the the brilliance of Harbaugh and Campbell is they got whiz kids working underneath them though. Dan, I mean Dan Campbell's Lions. He's, it, first of all. Did, both of those coaches, Aaron Glenn and Ben Johnson, I think are extraordinary. And but Ben Johnson um, is the definition of a whiz kid offensive coordinator and is a huge reason why. And, and again, that's a credit to Campbell that he, you know, he comes in uh, as an offensive guy and he makes that right hire and he delegates correctly and he's an amazing leader and I love him as a coach. But it's not like, you know, old school, traditional football. I mean, where Dan Campbell is like the most aggressive coach in the NFL right now when it comes to going for it, for example, which I think will be a big factor in this weekend's game. Uh, same thing, you know, with Harbaugh, I think, you know, I talked about some of the coordinators, the coaches at Michigan, that guy uh, who calls the defense is freaking amazing over there. And that's what, as we consider, like, again, Bill Belichick's possible undesirability that's what you need out of a head coach. It's not just about like, let's bring in the best play caller. Can we bring in the guy who identifies the best, best play caller, who nurtures these young coaches? And those two guys have been very successful at doing so. I was mocking earlier, Mina, that most people talking about football publicly can't actually explain to us very well why it is a coordinator is or isn't good. Although some of you have gotten better and you are someone who is consistently good at this. So explain to me what just happened with Fangio and what it means that he would leave Miami for Philadelphia when I think a lot of people don't understand that Fangio, while he was here was undone by injuries but didn't ever yeah. in his career have any answers for Josh Allen whatever it is the Dolphins were trying to do there they didn't get a defensive coordinator who could actually have any ideas about heat how to beat the best quarterback in their division well I think it's unfair to Fangio because if he had had a healthy defense we would have actually seen whether or not they would have been able to play Josh Allen and I'll say this I thought he did a hell of a job calling a game against Josh Allen yeah. given all of the injuries that they had Yeah, I'm glad you, um, I'm glad you called him out Mina on that because yeah. that Sunday night or they they got a lucky punt return that actually ended up taking out another I'm, backup I'm defender. just saying historically Fangio's numbers against jo Josh Allen has giant games I'm, I'm not taking he away was just credit. figuring this guy out I'm asking asking you what it means that he left Miami for Philadelphia. I don't think it so I haven't talked to anyone um who knows him or or knows what happened in Miami. My suspicion though is it wasn't like a pure like this wasn't like a, oh he failed, right? Um because I actually thought he did a pretty good job this season given all of the injuries on defense and especially in the second half of the season once guys started to get healthy, you saw this defense finally peaking. It's a complicated defense and then just unbelievable attrition defensively. I don't think you can pin any struggles at the end on Fangio. It's certainly not why, by the way, they lost and, and got knocked out. It's That was more about the offense. Um, I think, you know, it, it, it's, I, I'm speculating here, it sounds to me more like just kind of um, a personal thing, an interpersonal thing, potentially. Um, maybe there's another guy that they've got their eye on. I don't know. But this is not, a full, for me, and it might be a philosophical thing, too. Maybe Mike McDaniel wants a different kind of defense to pair with his offense. But I, I don't think Fangio failed as a defensive coordinator. I really don't. Do you have a favorite storyline this weekend, uh, whether it's dorky football storyline or just fun emotional storyline? I mean, it's dorky football. This Chiefs-Ravens game is insane. Like, I... I <laughs> 
just from a matchup perspective, this Ravens defense, you talk, you asked me about the impact of coordinators. It, it's such an incredible marriage of coaching and talent. Um, Cause in some ways, like what they do, it's very old school football. They play fast, they play physical, they hit hard. And then on the other hand, though, when you watch them, and, and if you want to watch them and, and really try to understand what makes this defense unique, just watch the fronts. Watch how many guys are lined up on the line of scrimmage at the start of every play, and then watch what happens as they scatter like cockroaches and, and drop into coverage, and someone's coming and someone's going, and no one seems to know what's happening at any time. They're amazing. I mean, they have solved all of these Shanahan offenses, the Niners, the Dolphins, the Texans. I want to see if the greatest quarterback – I believe in the history, the most talented quarterback I've ever seen can solve that. You're talking about a defense that uh, it has the best linebacker duo in the NFL, the best safety duo group in the NFL. They have answers for the Chiefs pass catchers. Patrick Mahomes, in my opinion, is going to have to go absolutely nuclear to win this game, which we, of course, know he's capable of. Help me with this part, though, because I don't understand how it is that it went from C.J. Stroud looking like he did against what yeah. I know to be a championship caliber defense in Cleveland and then the next week totally neutered by the Baltimore defense. Is that matchups or is it that Baltimore's defense uh, can be considered better than Cleveland's, which I thought was championship ready? They're very different defenses, and I think you really saw that play out in these two games back-to-back. -back. Cleveland's defense under Jim Schwartz play a lot of man coverage, four-man rush. We do what we do. We're going to win based on talent. You can scheme against that kind of defense, and Bobby Slowick did a masterful job of doing so. Ravens defense, on the other hand, I, I alluded to this, all of the confusion up front, the simulated pressures. They're showing you one look before. They're changing it after the snap. And what they're so good at, and this is, I think, a big part of the reason why uh, Houston didn't have success, they take away the middle of the field. They take away those in-breaking routes. This is what they did to Miami. Of course, you know, Tua loves to feast on the middle of the field. So did C.J. Stroud. Wasn't there for him in this game. And you throw on top of that, Texans can't run the ball for crap, and suddenly it was a bad matchup for him um, and a dominant performance from that defense. If I'd asked you two weeks ago, hey, we're going to watch Patrick Mahomes go nuclear against the Baltimore defense, you would have said no way, right? Three weeks ago, four weeks ago, there well, he is. There, be, no, just because he has it. Their offense, Mina, their offense this year. On is not, this show, Mina, their, Dan. Their offense has been worthy of the doubt we've given that offense. Who's given? I'm sorry. Did I not go on this program? This this you asked me to give a hot take. What when was this after? Yes, you did. Yes, yes you did. Yes, okay, fine. Victory lap. I told you so. Your Kornheiser, your Will Bond, make that your career the next twenty years. I believe the country <laughs> at large was doubting this Chiefs team and doubting the greatness of Patrick Mahomes. Uh, if he does it against Baltimore, you won't be surprised. No, I'll be surprised not because of Patrick Mahomes, but because it means that. Uh, one of his receivers has to really go off. And I think that's going to be very challenging. I like Rasheed Rice a lot. We got this like w w randomly great MVS game. That would probably have to happen again. And that would be genuinely shocking to me. I would like, I, when Mahomes, it was the first deep ball, the slot fate, when he threw that, no part of my body thought MVS would catch that football. When we saw it so arcing so perfectly down the right sideline. And he sort of like, I'm like, no, 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 no. I did not believe it at all. And then he caught it. And then he caught another one. If that, I don't think that's likely to happen twice. So that would probably have to happen for them to beat the Ravens. It's, it's, and somebody other than those two guys who have to make play. It, less than a minute here, but it's not the only thing that has to happen. We're not talking about you being right or Mahomes being nuclear guy. If Josh Allen uh, connects on that 80 yard throw and we're not talking about it. And he wouldn't have beaten Buffalo. If, if Stefan Diggs holds a perfect throw, one of the best throws you'll ever see in your life. Yeah, but it did happen. So nah. that's right. That's where I always lose. <laughs> yes, that's where I always lose. But it did happen. Who's playing in the Super Bowl, so, Mina? Yeah. Oh, there it is. Ravens Niners. Uh, I'd say no, it's boring. Uh, Ravens Niners. Oh, that's not boring. I no, mean, I mean we only got oh, like it's a great three, game. I yeah, we only got like three like days a... of of warming up to the race war between those two teams. Give me two weeks of that hype. Uh, Mina, come on. <laughs> the it's Nick Bosa memes alone will feed. <laughs> It's the going, generation. It, there's going to be a bad call that allows the Kansas City Chiefs to get to the Super Bowl. 
don't do this. Don't do No, we're not. No, I, re, I we're not doing you that. Seen those we're home splits. Th- you seen those home splits for that crew? Oh boy! I I, th- I saw also saw a great thread pointing out that the splits are basically identical to road. This is I don't do you did I, did I not say I don't like conspiracy theories? We're not doing ref conspiracy. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I reject the premise. We'll talk to you uh, next week. Looking forward to seeing you in Las Vegas. A thousand words by February 9th for Stu Gotts' <laughs> book that he's not going to write. Okay. That freaking guy. We're going to kick you in the teeth. All right, and and when you punch us back, we're going to smile at you, and when you knock us down, we're going to get up, and on the way up, we're going to bite a kneecap off, all right, and we're going to stand up, and then it's going to take two more shots to knock us down, all right, and on the way up, we're going to take your other kneecap, and we're going to get up, and then it's going to take three shots to get us down, and when we do, we're going to take another hunk out of you. Before before long, we're going to be the last one standing. We have a game, and we own that game, we finish that game. There is no light at the end of the tunnel. There is no light. I was proud of them, and I love the fight they have in them. And I love the grit. They haven't seen the playoffs since 1994, but Danny's in the driver's seat, you know he wants it more. He's gonna bite your kneecaps, he's gonna spank you like a child. He's chugging testosterone like it's going out of style. Jared Goff and the boys gonna run it down your throat. Bodies in their way, just like a motor city boat. Why don't you tell him to his face? The Lions ain't got what it takes to hoist the Lombardi on a Super Bowl Sunday. No matter who they're playing, they're gonna give them hell. It don't matter who they're playing, they're gonna give them hell. They don't care who they're playing, they're gonna give them hell. You better hope that you don't play them. Because they're going to give you hell. Camelot, hooray! Doesn't matter if you have one ass cheek and three toes, I will beat your ass. It means that <laughs> normally I'm 100%, 85%, man. That's all I need to be. It's our core foundation, man, grit. And what does it mean, really? In a nutshell, I think it means this. We'll go a little bit longer, we'll push a little harder, and we'll think a little deeper and a little sharper. You just got to get a hold of them, though. If you can just get a hold of them, and you start dragging their ass out to the deep, dark abyss, you can drown them. <laughs> <laughs> so what did he say? It doesn't matter whether you have what or three toes he's going to kick One ass cheek <laughs> or three toes. Put it on the pole, please, Juju. Which seems like an easy fight. Uh, At Levitar punch him down. Does it matter whether you have one ass cheek or three toes? Is Dan Campbell still going to kick your ass? I think everybody, when that for the introductory press conference happened, and he said, we're going to bite your kneecap off, and then on the way back up, we're going to bite your other kneecap. And that whole speech, we also, everybody made fun of it and was like, whoa, this guy's intense. I don't think we actually focused enough on the poetry of what he said that that the construction of that speech it's it's spoken word poetry and i think we should give him a little more credit for his literary genius uh charlotte I, maybe people know this on oddball but i don't think the people here know you actually uh are a poetry expert you studied poetry you wanted the most difficult career path of all i'm going to become a professional poet yeah and then i was like oh <laughs> how do you do that and here i am so yeah no i uh not to brag won the poetry Prize my senior year of college. Wow. So, what that mean? Uh, <laughs> in, I, <laughs> which, which explains my career path. Well, you were the only sports. contestant, also, because no oh, one else on. would choose okay, poetry was, as yeah. a career. Uh, real quick, I want to thank Darth Shredder for making that song. That's our first ever parody song that came with a music video. That's yeah. the way that that content creator decided to make that song. So we appreciate the creativity, wanted to reward the effort. Don't you guys want that poet to hoist the Lombardi Trophy? I mean, seriously. I mean, watching watching that as much as I'm a Kyle Shanahan guy, that that'd be pretty gnarly making yes. it to the Super Bowl too. I think we're guaranteed great storylines, no matter what gets in there. I want to better understand though Stugatz's viewpoint because again, another segment ended and he stood over. Me and he's right because he wanted me to end the last segment. Like he's like, You you idiot. Like I tossed you the ability to make fun of me because I've taken every possible position on the Kansas City Chiefs. 
and I didn't know what to do with it, and I limped into the break just on a terrible day. Just limped into the break, like, ah, I love Lamar Jackson. Big surprise. Like, rooting for Lamar Jackson. I'm sure that's hugely surprising to me, uh, to anybody out there, that I want the guy to win who nobody thought was going to be a quarterback. I think Lamar Jackson loves point break. <laughs> so what is your take officially on the Chiefs, uh, Stugatz? Because what we're headed toward in this game, right. if there's a controversial call, that favors the Chiefs oh boy. and gets them into the Super Bowl because the best possible result for the NFL is Jason Kelsey's drunk shirtless ass <laughs> and Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey being in the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. And people in Baltimore are already saying this game's going to be fixed. That it is, it really behooves a league with an officiating problem that the Kansas City Chiefs make the Super Bowl. If there is a call, Stugantz. Yep. That goes in these games that are decided by nothing. If but, there's a call against Baltimore that gets the Chiefs to the Super Bowl, conspiracy theories will be flying. What, but what yes. are I, I want to know what your take is because when the playoffs began, you said yep. that's the team I want to see. Felt and, good at the time. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and you also said that same week though, Patrick Mahomes uh, strolling into your stadium, anybody would be afraid of that. Your right. your takes have been I'm all, all over the place. All right, yeah. so yeah. let's let's pin you down. Right. The Kansas City Chiefs. Huh. Where are you on this? Please make some consistent word salad so we understand what your one position is on this. Can I get back to you on Monday or see what happens? He's so slippery. <laughs> He's dripping in grease right now. You're trying to Billy, like... help me. You're trying to produce the my, my original take was this Chiefs team is down. And this year you want the Chiefs strolling into your stadium because they're not playing that well. But then I saw him against Buffalo. Yeah. You do not want that guy strolling into your stadium, Dan. I am telling you, unless you're Lamar Jackson, because he's so much better and they're so much better than the Chiefs, this is exactly what you want. You don't want Josh Allen. Billy, help me. So please. you do or you don't Billy, want Billy, help me. I'm just, within Billy. the sentence. He's going to take every position on this, yeah, Billy. Yeah, Billy, let me roll because I'm trying to confuse <laughs> Dan so he has no idea what my position is. I mean. Let him cook, Billy. I'd like, the, I'd like the room's position on this. Jason Kelsey is saying on the number one podcast in America, he is saying that his wife asked him at Sunday's game because they were meeting Taylor Swift for the first time to be on his best behavior. And he, he was. He said to her, when you met me, I was blackout drunk. That is my yes. best behavior. Do you guys believe that all of that is so? And does Taylor Swift like that the Kelseys are relentlessly themselves, even though it's a little dirty because she's been surrounded by yes people for her entire adult life? Yeah, I absolutely believe that's his best behavior. He talked about it earlier on an episode of New Heights where when he met Kylie, his wife, the first time he met her, he was like blacked out drunk. So I really do believe that's his best behavior. In fairness, like, she's meeting the Kelsey family. Like, she should be the one. She should be on her best of, behavior. Exactly absolutely right. right. Like, yep. this is what you're, mm -hmm. if anything, this is a very honest representation of what you're in for. Like, can you hang or can you not? I also do believe that's Jason's best behavior. Yeah. He behaved very. Yeah. It, yeah. Everybody he kept his was pants talking on. about him. She's, she's courting too. Behaving best. Taylor needs also, to go out there in sub-zero temperatures and do something similar. Yeah. Yep. If you well, you're right. If you, no, uh, that no. Would be if you I said that. something yeah. similar. Yeah, not the exact same Kylie's thing. Face. Something similar. I'd yeah. settle for her being on rhythm. <laughs> oh, right. goddamn. What? No, we're not. We're well, not let, no. Let's have, finally let's have this conversation because I've been. I, people have made fun of my Caucasian delegation, the swag surf and the stealing of the swag surf. It's not about the stealing of it. Like, just you, you, you're a singer. You're a musician. How do you not know what oh, you rhythm meant dancing. is? Dancing. Yes. Sorry, I thought you meant in her music. No, no, I meant like. I was like, she's oh. already on on rhythm. Sorry, dancing. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, like how is that possible though? It, I, it just doesn't make sense. It would be like. Uh, like, hey, what do you do? I, I'm an Olympic track and field athlete. Yeah, oh, yeah, what do you do? Like, run the 100 meter, 200 meter. All right, how are your times? Pretty good, really good. I've, like, I've meddled a couple of times. All right, watch, let me watch you run. And, and they run like this. <laughs> Audio medium here. So. How is that possible? How is that possible? You how don't think you? a good singer can be a bad dancer? Not bad. No, so guys, I'm not talking about, like, dance routines. Swag serving is literally just left. Right, left to the beat of the, the rhythm of the music. That is very obvious. How is she missing this? How is she completely off, off rhythm when this is her job, pretty much? 
Lucy is in agreement with this. Huh. Yeah, I You're, mean, like, be careful with the Swifties here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, at this point, who's not going to be mad at me after today? Yeah. Um, she, when she would dance at award shows, that would always be sort of my thought. Like there would be like musicians playing, and I'd be like, that girl is offbeat. Yes. Wow. When she's, she's in the crowd, yeah, right? Yeah, when she's in the crowd, and like live your life, yeah. dance freely, do what you want. But Amin does have a point. Her her rhythm is not there when it comes to dancing. But um, Amin is making the one point, and I would say that I uh, our show has been crucified the last couple of weeks because we are not attacking the cultural appropriation of, uh, of, of stealing that dance. Dude, the swag surf was culturally appropriated like 10 years ago. Ten, like, when you, the first time you walked into the NBA game, the Heat do it every, like, third to fourth quarter transition. The moment you saw it at an NBA game, like, as and now everyone, let's swag surf, it was done. She didn't appropriate that. It was long gone. Texas A&M does the side to side. Once that happened, yeah, you were done. Kind of used to having things stolen from us. You know, they still woke. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. They, they saw it, and then they, they changed the definition. Yeah, they changed is, the definition to, you know, the N-word, basically. Yeah. <laughs> I believe that we should transition right from there effortlessly into how our show swag surfs as the critic of Taylor Swift and how she swag surfs. Here you go. Here's the video of our show swag surfing. You tell me if we're doing it well. You want to do a, a, yeah. a doom square of four people? Yeah. Swag. Yeah. Swag. 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 Oh my gosh. Oh god, I've oh, never man, felt whiter. Oh, 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 wider oh, wider god, oh, Jesus. It's fun oh. though. It is right yeah, there. No, dude. It is, you it, don't find joy say. in others having joy. So guys, you did the right thing. <laughs> what no, then he tried Froze? then he tried. <laughs> yeah. I just had uh oh. Giannis says he was surprised by the Griffin dismissal. <laughs> what? Steve Martin was a proud comment. That's funny. I think Mike was just trying to get us off of the swag surfing, and so he just did breaking news that wasn't NFL news. He didn't have anything. He didn't have anything. anything. He had. It's not even breaking news. It's broken news. I like it though. Look at him. It saved me from the epilepsy of watching that video. It got us off of it. Yes. Well done, Mike. (laughs) Save the show again, Mike, and you never get credit. No one ever says, "Hey, Mike, thanks for saving the show." I'm saying it though. That's what the money's for.